Good to see all your smiling faces. Um, is that too loud? Is that okay? Maybe is that, that's okay? All right. Good. Make sure you get a handout, of course, for our lesson today. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be uh, kind of a list. Uh, well, when we get to a certain part, it was a lot of fun for me to go through it as I saw what was happening. So maybe we'll have a few laughs together at the expense of the wise men of Babylon. But that's okay. Let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless this time. Father, we, we just must pause uh, as we come to study the Word of God. We, we can't even begin to grasp the the God that we're dealing with that loves us, that we love, and uh, the one who dwells in unapproachable light because of your absolute infinite moral purity and goodness and righteousness. And you have been pleased to show yourself to us in and through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, forever united with the Son of David, uh, full human nature, so that we can behold your beauty in the face of a human being. And we just, we just, Lord Jesus, I pray we we are all longing to be with you, to behold that glory. Uh, Thank you for what you will teach us this morning. I pray, dear Spirit, you'd superintend over your word and just uh, open it up to us, help us to marvel at what we see. Dear Lord God, as you in the book of Daniel are moving to accomplish your wonderful purposes, planned from eternity past that will find fulfillment in eternity future. So, bless our time. We, we commit our needs to you. We're a needy people, and you know all of our needs. Help us to, help us truly, Lord God, like Daniel, to to love you, to fear you, to trust you, and to obey you. For the glory of your name, we pray these things this morning, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> you know, Daniel, uh, I hope you're seeing, well, we're going to continue to see what a great book it is. It's just a magnificent book. Um, and I was thinking this morning, and we'll see it as we continue to go through it, that it's a book of contrasts. Um, we, we see throughout the contrast between the true and the living God, the God of Israel, the God of Daniel, and the false gods of this pagan nation, uh, Babylon, of the pagan nations. And we're going to see today the contrast between Daniel, a righteous man, and the king, an unrighteous pagan monarch. And these things are designed by God for us to see uh, and glean from them truth, as well as seeing that the true God is moving in all of history to accomplish his magnificent purposes, and nothing can stop that. We're going to talk about that right off the bat. So, the book of Daniel, key book in the Old Testament. Um, as we begin chapter 2, where we begin another major section in the book uh, of Daniel that extends from 2.1 through 7.28. Remember, we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of the book, a very, very wonderful structure designed by God to highlight the beauty that we see in chapter 7. It's the Aramaic section of the book, beginning in 2, verse 4, we will see that... Um, Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. So from from that verse on, 2.4 to 7.28, the language switches from Hebrew to Aramaic. Uh, And we talked about uh, why that is true in a sense. It contributes to the structure of of the book, the way that God put the book together to highlight certain truths. Um, And when we had our introduction, you can go back there and look at that marvelous structure. We're going to talk a little bit about it here just as, as a way of review and reminder, and uh, Tanner sums it up for us. So let's just think through it again. 
think through it again. Why, did, why would this happen? It's the only book like that in the Bible where you have this kind of uh, change in language. Uh, and he says, probably, and I think he's right, chapters 2 through 7 are intended as one literary unit. Uh, and the Aramaic language serves to underscore this conclusion. It's, it's there for a purpose. Um, though chapter 7 probably, I think we're going to see, serves as kind of a hinge chapter between chapters 1 through 6 and then 8 through the rest of the book. But chapter 7 kind of hinges between those two great sections of the book. And, and this part of the book emphasizes the Gentile nations that uh, Israel was being disciplined or judged by and subjected to under God's hand uh, during the Babylonian exile and the long history following it. We're going to talk about that history that we can look back and see, but he's predicting and prophesying about uh, in God's plan and purpose. Because of that, He's, it would be natural for these chapters to be written in Aramaic, since that was the lingua franca, language of the day of the Gentile world in Daniel's day. Uh, only when Christ returns, and we talked about this in the introduction, only when Christ returns, the Antichrist is defeated, and Messiah's kingdom is gloriously, wonderfully, formally established which are all major themes in the book of Daniel, uh, will Israel's discipline under God's hand come to an end. Uh, it's all part of God's plan in terms of how he's working to accomplish his will to exalt Jesus Christ as the lion and the lamb uh, for all eternity. So that's what's going on. So as he says it's fair, I think it is, too, to say that these chapters 2 through 7 then depict the roles, character, and succession of these Gentile nations of the world under whom Israel, even now, is being subjected prior to Messiah's kingdom. Um, these chapters affirm that these Gentile kingdoms have been allowed temporal rule under God's authority. It, 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 it has to be that way. Um, when you get to the final kingdom of the Antichrist, it, it's, it's God that permits that to happen. It's God that ordains that to happen. Uh, you can see that in the book of Revelation where his, all of his authority, it, it's, it's given by God to have that role in the world uh, because God is sovereign. And all authority is established by him. And then, so that's going to happen then until he's pleased to establish this everlasting messianic kingdom and that no adversary can successfully oppose him. I mean, this is a book. Uh, I want to read you. He has some text. Let's just, you know, in these first seven chapters, we're going to see, we're going to hit these verses again, but I, I just thought it'd be good to read them. Daniel 2.44, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. We're waiting for that. We're longing for that. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It's not going to be usurped by anybody else. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms that are unfolding. But it will itself endure forever. Key text, key theme. Daniel 4.3, when Nebuchadnezzar is hum humbled after the incident at the fiery furnace, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. You see, this is a, they have all kinds of gods, and we're going to see that today. But this is God setting himself on display. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. Daniel 4, 34 and 35, when Nebuchadnezzar himself is humbled. But at the end of that period, when he was humbled, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. 
And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. How does that impact your self-esteem? But he does according to his will in the host of heaven, righteous, wicked angels. It doesn't matter. He does his will. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? This is the God we know. Daniel 5, 21. He was also driven away from mankind, and his heart was made like that of the beasts, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, Nebuchadnezzar, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. And guess who he's going to set over it at the right time? The Messiah, his son, the king of Israel and the nations for the glory of his name. Daniel 6, after the lion's den. I make a decree that all in all the dominion of my kingdom, this is the after Babylon has fallen, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. Well, these are pagan rulers, king of kings of their day. And God is showing in this book of Daniel who he is and what he's doing in contrast to these kingdoms and their gods. Daniel 7, 7 14 the Messiah, Son of Man. And to him then, by this God, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel seven twenty seven. Then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. Because, see, it's our, it's our inheritance to rule with him in this kingdom. His kingdom, the king's kingdom, will be an everlasting kingdom, and his dominions will serve, his, his dominions, all the dominions will serve and obey him. So, we just, we're going to keep being confronted with that in Daniel. God's going to keep showing us that uh, so that we get the point <laughs> with, uh, to, to, to just grasp the, the God we're dealing with. And another thing that's neat, uh, that little chart down there uh, of the first uh, two through chapters 2 through 7, again, structure is ordained by God to be seen as he's the inspired author of the text, and the structure supports the focus of the book, and I think it's just kind of interesting. And so this, these, these chapters that tie together, for example, chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the four-part image, Gentile powers and Messiah's kingdom. But then look at chapter 7, Daniel's vision of the four beasts, Gentile powers and Messiah's kingdom. Chapters 3 and 6, there's a refusal to worship the image of gold, deliverance from the furnace. Chapter 6, Daniel's refusal to stop praying, deliverance from the lions. Chapters 4 and 5, chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the tree. He's humbled by, for his pride by animal-like madness. And then Belshazzar's feast, humbled for arrogant defiance by the defeat of Babylon itself. So all this structure is designed to do one thing, to, to point us to the beauty of who God is, to, to emphasize the reality of what he is doing, to bring glory to his name as he's going to establish his kingdom on the earth under his king. 
All right. A couple more introductory ideas then. Page two, here we have chapter two focuses on the dream that God gives to Nebuchadnezzar. As we progress through the chapter, we won't obviously get through it today, uh, we will see how God sets the stage for his name to be exalted in the midst of Nebuchadnezzar's pagan, godless court. <laughs> God moves on Nebuchadnezzar by giving him such a startling and significant dream that he abandons, and we're going to talk, we're going to see this, that he abandons the normal procedure for the interpretation of dreams by his wise men because with this unique dream, he does not want to run the risk of any kind of misinterpretation. This paves the way for God to show the inability we're going to see and helplessness of the king's wise men to use their black arts and demonic rituals to do what they were supposed to be experts in and for God then to use Daniel to speak for him and humble Nebuchadnezzar before him as he sets his glorious person on display as the only one true God who can declare the future because he controls the future. I mean, this is, this is what God is all about from beginning to end, folks, is the exaltation of his name, his fame, his reputation is what he is about in every way, which is why he's going to exalt Christ for all eternity, who is the very image of, of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He dispels in this section the false notion, because this was the notion of the pagan nations, that the gods of Babylon are superior to him because of Nebuchadnezzar's victory over Jerusalem and Judah's king. See, our, our gods are greater than their gods. Oh, <laughs> no way. We're going to see that Judah's God, Daniel's God, is God. That's the point. He is God. There is no other God. And the interpretation of the dream will establish the reality that he alone is in control of Babylon and all the subsequent unfolding earthly Gentile powers as he, the one true God of heaven, we'll talk about that term at the end of our lesson, moves with effortless might to bring about their demise and the establishment of his eternal kingdom under the Son of Man. This is a great book. <laughs> so let's dive in there together. How are we doing? Keep an eye on the time. The inability of the Babylonian wise men to interpret the king's dream. I, I think this is really cool as we go through this section. Um, you'll see why it caused me to laugh out loud. I shared it with Chris, and we're just laughing together. Anyway, we'll get there. First of all, in, in verses 1 through 3, this is no ordinary dream. No ordinary dream. Um, now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I, have, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Okay? Um, now, in, in the Hebrew, this idea, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, can be used, and I think it is here, to intensify the action of the verb, the way it's stated. So Tanner says, uh, this may suggest, and I think it does, that Nebuchadnezzar did not merely have a dream. He had an overwhelming or unusual dream. It wasn't like other dreams that truly baffled him this dream. What's different? This is a supernatural dream given to the king of Babylon by Daniel's God. 
in order to accomplish his purposes. Okay? It was not like any other dream the king had ever experienced, which is the reason for his unusual response. The dream caused his spirit to be troubled, and he was unable to sleep. His mind was so anxious, agitated, and troubled that he had insomnia. He, it, it, it wouldn't leave him. He, he couldn't sleep because he was so troubled and anxious. I, I don't know what this means. Because of the clarity and content of the dream, he desperately wanted to understand what it meant with respect to his kingship and kingdom. Okay? His kingship and kingdom. As a result, Nebuchadnezzar calls all the guys into his presence, the wise men who were responsible to address the specific issue of dream interpretation, the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. And I, you have an appendix at the back. I want you to go there on the wise men of Babylon. I, I I would normally not take time to go through an appendix, but I think this is important for you to get the gist of what's coming. Okay? So let's just look at it a little bit. Uh, these wise men, there's categories for them, okay? And it's good to kind of have a handle on what, who they are, what they're doing. The term magicians, uh, it, he gives the Hebrew term there, uh, a, a hartum, a magician was probably a diviner, one who used some sort of inscribed chart or magical design, possibly imposed on a chart of the stars, in order to arrive at an answer to questions put to him. Okay? The term conjurers, uh, in the NET it says astrologers, in the NIV it says enchanters, is the Hebrew word in as asafim a term derived from the Akkadian word meaning incantation priest. With their spells and incantations, they were believed to be able to communicate with the spirit world. Miller, in the New American Commentary, elaborates on the function of these two types of court officials, supposedly in touch with the world of the spirits and the gods. These individuals were advisors to the king on virtually every matter. They employed rites and spells intended to heal, exercise demons, or counter an evil spell placed upon the sufferer. Omens were studied in order to understand the future, and astrology played an important part in this activity. Techniques such as examining a sheep's liver, something like that, also were employed in decision-making. You can see that in Ezekiel 21 where it's mentioned. Dream interpretation was another function. Dream interpretation was another function of these wise men as, they, as may be observed from Daniel itself. Both of these officials, magi magicians and conjurers, served an important position to the king in the Babylonian culture, determining the will of the gods or the outcome of certain events was highly significant for them. The king thus relied on these officials to help him in making decisions through their access to occult knowledge. You're kind of getting the picture here. This was a big deal. Okay, we're going to see. <laughs> the third category are the sorcerers. This likely refers to the religious group, and he mentions it from Akkadian text known as uh, the... Kashafu, or I think that's right, I don't know, who used, they used herbs, charms, various potions, and was considered to be in league, they were considered to be in league with evil forces. And then, in essence, they practiced witchcraft, which was strongly forbidden by the Bible because it opened one's life to demonic influences. And you can see that. I mean, here, here's just one quote, Deuteronomy 18, 10 and 11 there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. That's worship to Molech. One who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, one who casts spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. Okay. Oh, by the way, just as an aside, I just typed in, the, the phrase into Google, witchcraft in America. Folks, 
There's books like Witchcraft for Dummies. You know, it is spreading like crazy in this nation. Witchcraft, occult practices are on the rise in America. We're, we're becoming so much darker than we ever were as a nation. And that's just one indication. Witchcraft. Fourth category is that of the Chaldeans. The Bible seems to use this term a, a number of different ways. One is that in an ethnic sense, okay, we, we know that is true. Uh, however, in Daniel 2.2, it seems to employ the word uh, Kasdim in a more restricted sense of experts or priests in the Chaldean religion or religious practices. They had numerous functions, one of which was astrology. Uh, their interest in the celestial bodies was for the purpose of ascertaining the outcome of future events, which made it evil since they opened themselves up to satanic deception. But, and, and we'll see in our text the word Chaldeans is used kind of as a a catch-all for all these wise men. All these wise men are kind of called the Chaldeans as they interact with the king um, in these following verses. Now, the last paragraph is kind of cool. One of their skills was the interpretation of dreams, okay? And records indicate that this had become a highly developed discipline in the ancient Near East. This would explain why the king summoned these guys following his dream. Dream manuals, you know, had even been composed with elaborate instructions on proper interpretation. Baldwin in the Tyndale Commentary in the Old Testament writes, these experts in dreams worked on the principle that dreams and their sequel followed an empirical law which given sufficient data could be established. The dream manuals of which several examples have come to light consist accordingly of historical dreams and the events that followed them arranged systematically for easy reference. They, they're big books to cover every possible eventuality if you, as you're dealing with a dream, especially if you're going to give the king an understanding. They were long, and you had to be an expert to use them and, and bring out the meaning for the dream. Uh, but here's the, here's the kicker. Only the expert could find his way through them, and even he had to know the dream to begin with before he could search for the nearest possible parallel and have the help he needed to figure it out. So that's, uh, I just, <laughs> that's where we're at. <laughs> These are the guys, right? So now let's keep going. This is where it gets really amazing to me. Interesting. We're going to read Daniel 2, 4 through 6, but we're going to read it as we kind of go through the, the bullet points. Um, so they come in, and they begin to interact with the, ki with the king. And, and folks, this is an amazing interaction, okay? Um, this is where it starts to get, get got really amu amusing to me. These men who were experts in the highly developed discipline and procedures in the ancient Near East of dream interpretation, expect, you know, when they're called to, to help the king with his dream, <laughs> um, they expect this encounter with this authoritarian monarch, I mean, he's, he could be brutal, uh, to be according to what they had always experienced when called to help him understand his dream. Here we go, boys, another day at the office. We can do this, no problem. They knew what to do. This is what they had spent their lives studying and becoming experts at. They had their books and manuals. They knew the procedures to follow to give the king an officially authorized interpretation. So, you know, we get to do our deal with the king. So as they enter the king's presence with confidence, they declare, O oh, king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. Man, they're, let's do it. <laughs> but here we go. This is not like any in previous encounter they have had with the king. 
whose word is law and absolute, by the way, instead of hearing the great Nebuchadnezzar tell them his dream, as in the past, so they could then do their thing and consult together using every available means at their disposal, including all the approved occult practices and their manuals with past recorded procedures, dreams, and results to come up with the best interpretation possible to please the king and be recognized for their expertise and help in easing his anxious mind, they hear him unimaginably declare this. The command from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb. And your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you'll receive gifts, reward, great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. Now, just here you are with the guys. All your buddies, you know, you got your books. You know the procedures. You got even a, a liver over here you're going to look at. <laughs> Something like that. Boys, isn't it, isn't it good to be a professional dream interpreter? Man, we're right in the presence of the king. Can you imagine the shock and horror <laughs> spreading through the ranks of the wise men of Babylon? You can just see them looking at one another, color draining from their faces, saying, Fred, what did the king just say? I don't think I heard him correctly. We don't have a book for that. Yeah, we don't have a book for that. This cannot be happening. Can you? It just made me laugh. Oh, king, you live forever. Tell us the dream, and we'll give you the right answer. You tell me the dream. What? This can't be happening. <laughs> okay, folks, these men are now in deadly serious trouble. King Nebuchadnezzar had absolute authority to ex execute his will. Didn't, wasn't that funny? Did you guys think that was funny? I, I just thought that was, I just started laughing in, in my study as I thought about these guys going, huh? huh? The king had absolute authority. There was no law governing or restraining his will to do what he desired. And they had just heard the command from me is firm. Firm means, in, in, in their language, marked by firm determination or resolution. It is irrefutable, assured, and unshakable. Their failure to obey the king's command was a death sentence. But not just any kind of death, a horrible death, torn limb from limb, literally dismembered as a way of killing you. And the impact on their families was devastating. The king adds, in your houses will be made a dung heap. Man, I wish I'd been a farmer. After hearing the death sentence for what they knew could not be accomplished, I'm not sure that the pronouncement of riches, I don't even know if they heard that part, but they did hear the end of it, therefore declare to me the dream and its interpretation. And, you know, hey, you guys profess to have supernatural abilities, to be in touch with the gods. You should be able to do this. When asked, even though this is a drastic departure from normal procedure. So, now we start to have the negotiating. Round one, or the second response, I'm sorry, this is the second response. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell the dream to his servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time. Inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there's only one decree for you, for you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. Man, can you sense the urgency? Your life's on the line. We've got to say something. 
And, and also, the king's response tells, in verses 8 and 9, tells us a great deal about his lack of genuine confidence in the entire system of dream interpretation. And I think, folks, which up till now, up till this point, he had no, no doubt been comfortable with because he's had a very successful reign. Oh, it's all working out. It's working together. This is... But now he was deeply troubled by a genuine, divine, supernatural dream that was outside the realm of comfort and could affect, indeed, his kingship and his kingdom. He targets their lack of ability to fulfill his command, accusing them of bargaining for time. But what are they doing? Maybe, maybe he'll be persuaded to reverse his decree. A Babylonian king could do that, he could do anything he wanted. It, 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 he could break laws. He could say this. He could change his mind. The next, so maybe they're hoping to ch he'll change his resolve and return to the normal way things were done in dream interpretation, in, the, in this business of interpreting dreams, thus allowing them to survive this life-threatening situation. Right? He not only does not back down, but he becomes more determined to hold their feet to the fire, knowing that the only way he can ensure a correct interpretation is for them to tell him the dream. Otherwise, they're just going to get together and come up with an interpretation that's a lie, false interpretation. Final word from the king, therefore tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. I think this is good, what Tanner said here. Why was it so disturbing? What made the king so insistent to act this rashly about a mere, a mere dream? Probably the dream itself had terrified the king and left him fearful, obviously. But then he says on the top of page five there, although he did not understand the details of the dream, the very thought that a stone, a stone destroying a statue that was obviously a royal figure in the dream, may have regard, been regarded by him as a kind of divine omen that he might be assassinated or something, or that his kingdom be overthrown. Hence, he wanted to be absolutely certain of its interpretation. It wouldn't do any good for them to schmooze him with this one. It's too scary. It's too scary. Third round, Chaldeans. This is amazing. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter to the king, inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who could declare it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Okay? Let's, let's, and we know we're going to see what he says. The wise men, knowing that they are about to suffer a horrible death, make one last attempt to plead for their lives as they reason with the king. They make three points in their defense, hoping that the king will take pity on them and reverse his firm command. First thing that they say is that there's no man alive, regardless of training or expertise, like a magician, conjurer, sorcerer, or Chaldean that could tell the king what he dreamed. It's impossible to know the king's thoughts or dreams unless he reveals them. How do you get, I can't read your mind, king. Second, they make what is, they, the second point they make is that what the king is demanding is unheard of. It's out of bounds, king. It's out of bounds with respect to the well-established discipline of dream interpretation. What he is asking is not fair. He's not playing by the rules of the dream interpretation game. No great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. You get the point? You're not playing fair, king. It's not the way it works. This third point's amazing, though. The third point they make is that what the king is demanding is only something the gods could declare, and they do not dwell with men. Essentially, 
The gods could declare what the king dreamed, but they're not present to give men the information. They know, but they're not talking. Now, what was their job? Who were they supposed to interact with to get information for the king? The gods. So, it's a confession by the wise men that what they were supposed to be expert in determining the will of the gods or the outcome of future events through their professional and proficient use of occult practices, they are unable to do. The whole point to their magical arts, rituals, and astrology was to learn the will of the gods and the outcome of earthly events. Now they confess that their system does not work. Isn't that, isn't God, look what God is doing to set himself on display. The contrast we're going to see between the true and the living God and this false, demonic foolishness, God is going to just highlight by what he's doing with the king in this dream. The God of Daniel and his young Jewish companions has orchestrated these events to exalt his name as the one who alone can reveal this knowledge to men. He can do what they claim is impossible for men to do, even aided by all these occult rituals and practices. He can reveal what they say only the gods can know because he is the only one true God of heaven. God's going to show, as he did in Egypt. Remember the wise men in Egypt? who were doing all the stuff that Moses was doing, and then they get to the point where they're filled with disease, and they're going, this is God. We can't duplicate that. <clears throat> He's going to do the same thing. The great creator God is more powerful than all the demonic occult practices promoted by the enemy. Um, just an implication, folks, for us. Not... Today in our modern culture, just like in the ancient Babylon, men run everywhere else but to the truth of the word of the true God of heaven, to understand him, life, death, and eternity. They go everywhere else. There's all kinds of baloney out there to answer those kinds of critical questions instead of coming to the word of the living God to understand life and death and eternity. Just talk to people. We're no different than them. The wise men's final argument and reasonings with their king only served to make him more enraged with them. He's beyond reasoning with. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar then issued a decree that all the wise men should be slain, and this included Daniel and his friends, right? Okay, so that's where we're at. The king is in a blind rage and anger because he's not getting what he wants. And now we're going to see Daniel's response to this. Daniel's intercession and prayer, 14 through 18. Daniel's intercession with the king. Then Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Ariok, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He said to Ariok, the king's commander, for, for what reason is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Ariok informed Daniel about the matter. So Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. So, as we see the response of Daniel to this, this is a life-threatening situation. <laughs> There's a marked contrast, people, to the raging, controlled, uncontrolled anger of King Nebuchadnezzar. This is the difference Dear people, this is the difference between one who is living 
in the light of relationship with the true and living God and one who is living in the darkness of satanic blindness. And I, I think there's a point here. You know, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, from Cain and Abel on down, dear people, there's only two kinds of individuals here in this room, in this society, there's only two kinds of people. There's the righteous and the wicked. There's no middle ground. You're either righteous or you're wicked. You're either a wise man or you're a fool. It's the way it is. And those two people are on two different paths, aren't they? The righteous are on the narrow path that leads to life. The wicked are on the broad road that leads to destruction. And there's two destinies. One is eternal life and one is eternal death. All of us right now in this room are in one of those two groups. And as we read through the Bible, you will see the character of a righteous man like Daniel. And we can look at that and say, okay, God gave... The righteous have a heart given by God. And it results in certain behavior and things that are true about them in their lives, the way, like this, like Daniel here. So we can say, okay, I, I have that kind of heart. H how does my life look? Do I, does my life reflect the kind of life that Daniel's manifesting, who loves God, trusts God, fears God, obeys God? because he's an example to me if I'm a righteous man. And then there's the wicked king with the rage, and I want my way, and I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get my way. Maybe that's you. I don't know. The difference is eternal life or eternal death. May God help us to be, by the grace of God, lovers of Daniel's God and manifesting that reality in our lives. It's important. All right. Nebuchadnezzar had sent Arioch, the captain of his personal bodyguard, to fulfill his command to execute the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel, we, we read, discretion and discernment, that's how he responds. Those two ideas are synonyms and focus on Daniel interacting with Arioch in a very prudent and tactful and wise way as he sought to find out information. The reason, uh, why is it so urgent? Notice he didn't oppose Arioch. He, he wasn't start being critical of the king. He wasn't going out making, you know, let's get plans to get out of the city. He doesn't do that. His demeanor, speech, and actions can only be attributed to one thing. What is that? He knows God. He knows and loves God, his God. And what his God, who his God is, the true God of heaven, the covenantal keeping God of his fathers. Daniel was a man who knew, trusted, feared, and loved his God. He knew that God was in control of his personal circumstances. He knew God ruled over the nations. Nebuchadnezzar was not ultimately in control of whether he lived or died. Remember Jesus and Pilate? Don't you know I have authority to put you to death or release you? You have no authority if it hadn't been given to you by God. It's Daniel's attitude. We know that Daniel's our God is our God. The saints throughout history have clung to the God's precious, magnificent promises as they live under his care in the midst of a fallen, dark world that lies in the lap of the evil one. We have promises that Daniel did not have in terms of their beauty and majesty now that Christ has come. The risen, exalted Lord Jesus himself, who is the ruler of the kings of the earth, has declared to us that he loves us, released us from our sins by his blood. He has told us he will never leave us or forsake us, that he is with us always, even to the end of the age. He bids us to come with confidence to his throne of grace, to receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. He's coming to rescue us from the wrath to come so that we will be with him forever. We have an intimate, personal love relationship with the risen, exalted, glorified Son of Man that Daniel only saw from a distance, who's now seated at the right hand of God the Father. We're hidden with Him in God. 
and no one can ever snatch us out of his hand. Nothing can touch us unless it's ordered from his throne. As the song says, I love this, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Isn't that great? When the hard times come, may we, like Daniel, reflect the reality that we know, love, and fear, and trust the one who holds us in his omnipotent, faithful, loving hands for our good and his glory. So I think Daniel's respectful, wise, prudent interaction with one of the king's top warriors. <laughs> he could have just chopped his head off right there. Oh, no, no, they were supposed to be dismembered, sorry. Resulted in Daniel having opportunity to either personally enter the king's presence or get a message to him. And, and what does he ask? He asks for time. And notice the king didn't say, you're stalling for time, buddy, just like these other dudes. He doesn't say that. There's a lot of respect for Daniel. Remember how they were exalted in their examination by the king? They're the top guys. They have integrity. They know what they're doing. So he grants him the request. And it's important to see Daniel's faith as he hopes to declare the interpretation of the dream to the king. Okay? So what happens? Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Okay? So let's talk about it a little bit. Um, what does Daniel do with the time the king allows him to have? What's he go do? Let's have a prayer meeting. Right? What did you say? I'm sorry. Yeah, it tells his friends with the purpose of, man, we've got to pray. We've got to pray together. They're all in the same boat. Right? So he went to pray with him. What is the importance of, uh, do you think, of gathering his friends? He could have gone and prayed on his own. What's the, what's the importance of gathering uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter? What's, why is that? What do you think is important about that? Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that throughout the whole New Testament when, when critical things come up? The body gathers. The church gathers. We have corporate prayer meetings together. Like-minded hearts before the throne of grace petitioning for these critical... So he goes... And notice there, it's their Hebrew names that are mentioned, not their Babylonian names, because they're going to they're gonna approach the God of Israel, as we will see, and ask for... Uh, how do they address God, by the way? What do, they, what do they say about God? How do they describe him? The God of heaven, okay? They, 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 they request compassion from the God of heaven. It doesn't say that they're just running in there. Tell us what it means. Tell us what. No, they want compassion from him. See, he's in control. They also add concerning this mystery, okay? And, and, and so that what would what would happen, that they wouldn't be destroyed. Now, people, I, I don't think they're concerned about losing their lives. But I think they do understand that God has his hand on them in this pagan place for a purpose. He's already blessed them, made them top in their class, advisors to the king. They understand that there's a purpose to their being placed here, and so it's not about, we don't think it's about being destroyed, God. We think it's about being used here, so have compassion. It's not that you can't take our lives. You know, compassion from God. Now, the God of heaven, that's interesting because what, what is going on with all these false conjurers and stuff with their arts? They're looking at the stars and they're looking at what's been created, and they're making charts, and they're getting occult ideas. 
They're saying, we're going to the God who created those stars. You guys are down here playing around with demonic stuff. We're going to the source, the God of heaven, the creator God of the stars. I think that's on the table. That's why they mention his, his name that way. Okay, so it's just neat to see their response. Calm, not panicking. Contrast between Daniel and his friends and the king because they know the true and the living God. So just any thoughts today from you? What, what can we learn? Just anything that hits you from Daniel's response to this life-threatening situation. Just any thoughts? We have a few minutes left. What can we learn as we look at this? Yes, sir. Very good. And, and, and wasn't he humble even interacting with this great warrior who could have just He's humble uh, before the Lord and before the authorities God has placed over him, not being critical, not being, you know, raising his fist against the government. He's trusting God. Good. Any th- yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's a different ball game, isn't it, for Daniel? He knows the God who can give the interpretation. And they're playing games. Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wonderful power to that, being together and praying like that. Amen. Anything else? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We, we know we're going to see that in the next event. Go ahead, uh, Mark. You know, it's an excellent example of Daniel believing and trusting in God's sovereignty. Amen. And, you know, that, as Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but it's every word. Yeah. And yeah. God is, God is giving him life. God really is in control of the situation. Amen. Amen. I think that exactly. So when we enter the hard times and we know this God, we can, by the grace of God, respond the same way. Show the world you trust him. Even if they take your life, show the world you love him more than your life because he's in control of whether that happens or not, just like the church at Smyrna in Revelation Okay, very good. Keep thinking we want to be like Daniel by the grace of God because if you're a Christian, you have a heart like him. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this time in Daniel. Continue to bless us through this book. Show yourself to us in all your glory and majesty and splendor as you're moving in the history of nations to bring about the return of the Son of Man to establish his glorious kingdom on earth. We long for that, Lord, and help us to be like Daniel because we know you, Lord Jesus, the Son of Man who's coming again. Help us with hearts given by you in new covenant grace to live out our faith and our trust and our love for you and obey you because of that relationship. Thank you again for this time. Bless our service now for the glory of Jesus Christ, Father, unto your great name in the power of the Spirit. Amen.